There's nothing like a solid walnut table. The rich and luxurious brown brings sophistication to any space. The organic charm flows well with many colors, textures, and styles, but these beautiful traits don't always last forever. That is if there was an extra care taken to prevent it. This table, for instance, has been well-loved by its family. Abrasion from cleaners, scuffs, scratches, dents, and even serious sun bleaching tells a lifetime story of this dining table. So how can we take this faded slab of walnut, give it new life, and create a masterpiece that will last generations rather than years? Part of the reason this table hasn't lasted very long is the soft finish. My fingernail makes an easy indentation. There was also no form of UV protection, so the sunlight from years of windows yellowed the overall color. You can see the vast difference between the lower apron and the top itself. There's also a lot of finish delamination on the sides, and this is probably from cleaning it. The reason I even made this video is because there seems to be a lack of advanced wood finishing content available to us on YouTube right now. So people are taking these beautiful pieces of furniture, slapping a hard wax oil on them, and pretending they will last centuries. But the hard truth of hard wax oil is, it only lasts about one year. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my clients calling me every year because their finish has worn down to nothing. Don't get me wrong though, all finishes have their place, and some are much easier to use than others. I guess what I'm getting at is, why would you spend hours on end learning how to cut, joint, plane, sand, and build truly astonishing furniture, but not be willing to learn advanced finishing techniques? So why should you believe me? Aren't I just another woodworker with personal preferences and opinions? And of course that answer is yes, but I will offer insight into why my techniques work and real life examples to back them up. And my first experience that I'd like to share is, taking everything fully apart makes things a lot easier to strip and refinish. Even if this means I have to do a little cutting, it's worth it to break everything down to flat panels again, mainly because we will be doing a special coloring process that's a lot easier to do on individual items rather than an assembly. I'm flipping the table upside down to start the bottom first, and now all the components are ready for stripping. There are countless ways to take a film finish off of wood. Scraping is definitely one of the most satisfying ways for me. Orbital sanding is also a great option, especially if you have good dust collection. And this finish is so thin, I can take it off with one single pass of 120 grit. An edge sander is also a great option as long as you're careful. I did just mention as long as you're careful. A drum sander is also a great option, although for me this is one of the slowest but most precise methods. So I couldn't help but notice myself gravitate back to scraping and orbital sanding. It just takes care of every prepping step in one go, rather than switching between all these methods. But the edge sander does come in handy for re-establishing the miters on the leg brackets. And doing any of the curved details. There's also chemical strippers. But most of these products give off fumes that literally smell like a heaping pile of hot trash on a summer day. So I recommend only using them if your finish is troublesome or if your project has intricate nooks and crannies. <sighs> wow, it looks like I have my work cut out for me because this walnut is the most mismatched colors I've ever seen in my entire life. And it's true, this walnut has warm tones, cool tones, lights, darks, and even some wood that doesn't look like walnut. The benefit of this though is now I get to show you how to do a specialized process of color toning wood that only the best wood finishers know. 
Before that process, we need to finish prepping the table. I'm using 120 grit on my random orbital, and you may be wondering why I'm even wasting my time on the bottom. And trust me, I thought about it. But if I'm finishing this table to last generations, I better do every square inch and leave no stone unturned. I'm choosing not to sand off the manufacturer's information because I feel it would erase some of its history, so I'll add my logo next to it later for a refinishing stamp. You may have noticed earlier that I marked letters where each piece goes so that everything can be reassembled the exact same way, and those marks are almost gone now so I'll rewrite them before they disappear. With the bottom sanded to 150 grit, I can flip it over and do the top. Starting on the bottom is common practice for many steps in woodworking. This leaves some room for the top to get damaged during previous steps, and now the top is last, therefore any damage can be sanded out, leaving the top perfect. Since this walnut had a chance to fade so badly, there is a lot of sanding needed to get down to fresh colored wood, so it's easier to just take my time and roll with the punches. It's critically important to blow out any dust from the grain before the next step. My next important experience is learning how to water pop the grain correctly. Water popping is more of a slang term. Another way to say it is raising the grain. This is a fairly simple process of saturating the surface with water and wiping off any unabsorbed areas with a dry rag. Don't forget to do the sides. This will protect them from finish delamination in the future. So what's the purpose of raising or popping the grain? And I'll have to show you. When we saturate wood, the surface fibers swell and raise. Then when this is dry, we can sand those off, creating an ultra smooth surface or so the woodworking community has thought. I think differently simply because I've taken a closer look. When the fibers are raised then sanded off, this actually takes away material, creating a more porous surface. This would technically make it more coarse rather than smooth. And if you raise the grain well enough and sand it off, that grain can't raise again because it's gone. Now your finish will have a more coarse surface to adhere to, and most importantly, if water ever infiltrates that finish, such as on a well-trafficked table, then the water won't have a chance to raise that grain and to destroy the bond between the finish and the wood. So its most important benefit is to protect the wood from the inevitable moisture in the future. This is when you can final sand to 220 and hit the details. We blew the dust out of the grain earlier to keep the pores open for this next step. We are using walnut colored wood filler. I initially tried the wood filler straight out of the container on a test piece, but I noticed it seemed too light and pastel-like. So I added black dye to make it much darker, but this made the pores look a touch too black. So the perfect mixture ended up being the walnut filler with a touch of walnut dye to darken it. In order to test any colors of any step that I do, it's going to be most accurate if I test it on, of course, the same wood and with the final finish that will be applied. The wood filler is spilled onto a piece of plywood then tinted with dark walnut trans tint dye, which I will link in the description. This wood filler is a bit too thick for pour filler, so I have to dilute it with water until it has a smoother texture. I'm looking for a pudding consistency with this first coat. We don't want it to be too thin and shrink up too much. Spreading it on across the grain will push it into the pores better. And trust me, make sure your trowel or spreading tool doesn't have any burrs on it that can cause scratches in the wood. Spread it on with firm pressure, then scrape off the excess by tilting your knife upward for a better scraping action. Then wait until it's completely dry. Upon a closer look, you can see some of the pores still aren't filled. So let's give it a quick sanding with 220 and hit it again. This time we're looking for more of a pancake batter consistency. This will make it easier for the filler to penetrate the micro pores that are left over, and we won't have to worry as much about this coat shrinking. The edges aren't pore filled because I really only need the top of the table to be incredibly smooth. And to be honest, you don't even need a pore fill if you want a more natural oil rubbed look to your finish. 
I do make sure that I leave no cloudiness anywhere and sand thoroughly with 220. I'm also checking for streaking since there was colorant in the filler. Sometimes this can stain the table. The goal of all these advanced steps is to create a beautiful, dark, and rich walnut color that remains pretty even throughout the table. And that last pore fill step is the first step in creating that consistent look because now all of the top boards have one thing in common. They have the same color of pores. This will help unite all of the different tones of boards as well as create a perfectly smooth surface for us to put finish on. The next step is to color crack some of the lighter sapwood boards as well as tone the whole table a bit darker with something called toner. The way professional finishers color correct wood is with a base like water or denatured alcohol and aniline dye. In my case, I'm using water and dark walnut trans tint dye. Don't make it too dark though. The final toner will be water and black trans tint dye. The black will help darken everything and cool down the red tones in the walnut. Like I said before, I always start on the bottom. This will give me an opportunity to adjust my sprayer and fine tune the strength of the colorants in my mixtures. Filtering it will make sure I'm not spraying trash onto my table. This first color is the walnut color corrector, and we want the spray pattern to be tight and precise. Spraying the sapwood boards with a little bit of color will help them blend into the browns, but not destroy the beautiful contrast that they create. For this bottom side, I'm not worrying much about overspray on the darker boards. It really is pretty easy to blend in with a wet rag. This dye mixture doesn't have a binder, so we can manipulate it fairly easy with water. It will likely take a few coats to reach a nice blend with the other boards. The top is the important part, so I'm taping this board off so I only color it and nothing else. Spraying very light coats will reduce how much the colorant wicks under the tape. And even then it will wick slightly and that's why we don't make the mixture too dark. Dark toners are much harder to blend. There are also a few other white spots that need color in the middle of the table, so I blend those in like before. A few of the smaller components also need a touch of the color corrector. Now even though we're done with it, it's always important to save it until the project is completely finished and delivered. The black toner is going to be sprayed over every part of the table, so we want the spray pattern to be nice and wide this time for even coverage. If you notice, I wrapped a towel around the top of my gun's cup. That's because this thin liquid tends to find its way out of the cap and creates splatters on the project. Having light color in the mixture and spraying evenly is going to be the key here. Every single surface gets two light coats. I want to see the wood darken but not become saturated. Oversaturation can cause weird color separation and other inconsistencies. So up until this point, how do I know that I'm remaining consistent with the test pieces that I performed? And that's actually much more simple than you'd think. This step panel is a progression of every step I performed in order. So now I can use this tester to check the color saturation and value of every step I do on the real table. And since I was consistent with my steps, everything is working as planned. And by the way, trans tint looks chalky when it's dry, but this will go away with finish. The clear finish I'm using is the Imran Acrylic Polyurethane line. It has a sealer, top coat, and catalyst. Just make sure to use proper protective equipment. With this product line, the sealer is used for the initial build coats. 10% catalyst is added to activate the curing process. That whole mixture needs to be reduced about 20-30% to with butyl acetate to make it sprayable. I'm also adding a few drops of the same black trans tint dye to further tone the wood a slight bit darker. I can hear your thoughts now. Why in the heck am I adding so much color to every step? Isn't this thing going to be way too dark in the end? And honestly, here's where some of the science gets pretty cool. 
When I add dye straight to the wood, it actually physically changes the color of that wood on the surface by soaking into the grain and becoming a part of the overall color. And dye is pretty much perfectly transparent, unlike pigment-based stains. So none of the grain gets hidden. But here's the cool part. If I add dye to the finish, this will create another color layer on top of, rather than a part of, the table underneath. This creates a beautiful thing called color depth. And as long as you didn't add too much color in your finish, a little goes a long way here. I mentioned earlier that the table had faded from sun bleaching. This is from UV exposure damaging the wood and finish. This colorant helps reduce the amount of UV exposure by acting like window tint. And alongside the UV resistance of the Imron product itself, this table should retain its beautiful color for a long freaking time. My sprayer cup has a filter built in, otherwise I'd be screening this for particulate. Make sure you ventilate your space well. I'm making sure I'm getting really good atomization before I begin. This isn't the hardest product to spray, but it certainly isn't the easiest in my dry climate. Blow off any dust, but don't use a rag or a tack cloth to avoid getting fibers caught in the grain. Practice on the bottom of the table first. I'm overlapping by about one third each time. And if you're going for an oil rubbed look, then you're practically already done. You can give it a quick scuff sand with a fine sanding pad and shoot one coat of top coat in the same day. All parts get two coats of this color altered sealer. Then a third coat of sealer without dye added will be the layer that I sand. Let's see if we are on target with the step panel. And we are. The top gets the same third coat of clear sealer, then a good hour of cure time. This product sands astonishingly well with 320 or 400 grit. Then I can spray a final fourth coat of sealer on the top for more build since I'm going for a buttery smooth final finish. After an entire night of curing, the sealer can be flat sanded with 400 grit. I wouldn't go any coarser than 400 grit because the deeper scratch marks could translate through into the top coat. The edges are fine tuned with a super fine 3M pad. Then the whole thing can be wiped down with a white microfiber cloth. Then vacuum to get rid of any fibers. If there's any dust left in any grain, make sure it gets blown out because those particles would show through the final top coat. I also sand the other components and vacuum them off. The top coat is the Imran acrylic urethane in satin. It's mixed with the same catalyst and reducer as the sealer and sprays easier than the sealer as well. I mean, look at that nice laydown. I wait about four hours for the tabletop to start curing, then give it a feel with my hand. If there are any micro bubbles or dust nibs, there is one careful thing I can do to smooth those over. With a very wet and used 1000 grit sanding pad, I very gently glide the pad over any affected areas. Only a few passes allowed, otherwise the sheen will be affected. To reassemble the table aprons, I'm using epoxy since the surfaces are sealed and wood glue will no longer work. The leg supports get a coat on each miter, then I can lightly drive the screws. Then using the actual leg as a spacer block, I can finish driving the screws home. The legs aren't actually glued on because they need to remain removable. With the finish cured over the weekend, I can get some help from the lovely lady of the house. Right now is a good time to inlay my emblem while the table is upside down and I'll let the spectator know that this was refinished by Fortress. Then everything can simply be reattached using the same mounting holes as before. <sighs> and we made it. And this was a shorter project, although not all simple, but it was worth it. So comment any questions below, and it's time for final shots.
You can subscribe by clicking on the left icon, and here's another awesome video to watch.